God, your spirit we love to be near you, O oh God. When you come with our hands, with our hands to the heavens alive in your presence, O oh God. When you come, so pour out your spirit we love to be near you, O oh God. When you come. Who knows that the mercies of God are are every day? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank God for that. Amen. 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 There's nothing you can do that will separate you from God. Amen.
brought us out when we were weak. Who brought us out when we didn't see the way? Who brought us out? Who brought us out? Who did God send for you and me? And who died on the cross for you and me? And who can we worship freely? And who is set us free?
We got a hungry country But there's a hungry city out there waiting for you and me Waiting for you and me To go share the name of Jesus They want to be free They want to be free They're all hurting They're all in pain They're all thirsty They quench their thirst with other things But the only thing that really quenches your thirst the only thing that heals pain, the only thing that'll bring you out and strengthen you, is Jesus. We have a world out there that's hungry and thirsty and wanting something more. They know there's something more, and that's why. That's why they're so thirsty. As a deer panted after the water, so does my heart panted after the Lord. Amen. I seek after God. And I will drink from His well. And I'll never go thirsty again. Amen. It's the only thing. It's the only thing. The only person that'll quench the thirst of a man. It's Jesus. So we lift your name, Jesus. Jesus is above every name. Amen. There is no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. But in the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We thank God for the name. We thank God that there is a name that's been given. Hallelujah. It sets the captives free. Amen. That brings life and light to the hurting. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Turn around and tell somebody G the name of Jesus is the answer. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. Then you may be seated. Hallelujah. If I say hallelujah. hallelujah. Praise God. We'll go ahead and get, it, get ahead and get in here. Um, got an announcement. My wife's not in here, but I was, we, uh, we talked about this lightly last night. Uh, go ahead and write down tentatively. Okay, we got to make sure it all works out. But right now, tentatively, we're going to plan on an Eastern Carolina Down East barbecue on the first weekend of November. I believe that we, we, uh, we all have off that Friday. Uh, it's an it's a, uh, optional teacher work day, which means you don't have to go. Which, yeah, which means I, I, can, I can work. And remember last year, this, that time, I was in the hospital. Huh? The Thursday is. Mommy said it was backwards. But it doesn't matter because I can work on Thursday or whatever. One of the days is optional. Yeah, so, which means I can, I, yeah. yeah, so we can cook barbecue. Get the potatoes ready. Get the coleslaw. <coughs> I'm sorry. That's the pastor's job. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. You know, I, I'm, I just want to volunteer for quality control, which means he wants to be the taste tester. Right. Hallelujah. You know if I'm making this right. Yes. Yeah, okay. November the 4th. Yep. So 
we didn't do it at all last year. You know, remember I had, had gone in the hospital that that uh, that week, and weren't really in, in in a position to cook. <laughs> Hallelujah, glory to God, Amen. So uh, this year I am glory. A A to the men. Can you say A to the men? Hallelujah. And uh, so just be kind of planning on that. We'll uh, we'll, we'll give a confirmed announcement about that later. But we just kind of want you to go ahead and get it kind of marked down so you don't make a fall trip plan right on that date and miss it. You know, because it'll have been two years already. By then, it'll be two years since we've done it. So you don't want to, you don't want to make it back to three or four. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah! Praise God. Uh, don't forget our Wednesday night uh, Bible studies. Praise God, and um, all the other things that God is good about. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah! No kids are getting ready to go back to school soon and very soon. Yeah, yeah that's a, that's a joyous time. Never is a kid that I ever look forward to going back. All righty, praise God. Well, this time we're going to receive our Sunday morning tithe and offering. If you need an offering envelope, raise your hand. If you're sitting electronically, go ahead and take care of that. Glory to God. Uh, through Square Cash, PayPal. Jess will be putting up on the uh, screen how to, how to give with the electronic means. It'll pop up there in just a second. Uh, praise God. We, we added a feature with um, our Mevo. And it allows us to have slides saved that you can just hit them, pop them up on the screen and um, have that information out there without having to um, sit there and type it every single service. Okay? So it actually pop up on the screen. Now, instead of the feed, it goes up on the screen. Hallelujah. And I'm waiting for it to show up, but hallelujah. What, Jesse? Okay, mine's on delay. All right, there it went. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Y'all love Jesus? You know, the Word of God says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the tithe. We thank you for the offering. Thank you the people are blessed in accordance with your holy word. And thank you that the windows of heaven are opened unto them. And you pour out blessings on them that don't have room enough to receive. If you're at home watching us, we just we would, uh, invite you, if you would like to, to join with us in giving to Faith and Victory Church and helping us do what God's called us to do uh, in reaching the world and carrying the gospel throughout the, to the nations. And uh, the information should be up on your screen. Um, I see some kind of funky little thing up there. I'm not really sure what it is. I guess, is that it, Jesse? Okay, that was it. I couldn't tell. Hallelujah. It's in kind of a, you know, the artsy people come out. I'm, I'm like, you know, just give me text. You know, gotta, it's got to be artsy. Hallelujah. Praise God. All right. Go ahead and receive that, uh, Usher. Er. Hallelujah. Be blessed as you give. As soon as that's done. Uh, oh, you know what it is? Yeah. Yep. It's a little piece of tape we put on the uh, microphone cable. <laughs> Came off. Yeah, Jesse, actually, it's a Mission Impossible thing. There's a little tracker on me. <laughs> God just wants to know where I am when the rapture takes place. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, got them tagged. We know where they are. And we actually do. We got the seal of the Holy Ghost on us. Hallelujah. Amen. Children's Church Preschool, you're dismissed. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The rest of you, open your Bibles to the... Um, 15th uh, chapter of the Gospel of John, and we're continuing our teaching. We're talking about walking in love and talking about the love of God. And we've been, um, I tell you, this is just probably um, one of the best passages of Scripture uh, in the New Testament as far as sharing, finding the heart of God, uh, the, what, what Jesus wanted. And I, I, as we said as we began this, back in the 13th chapter, when he, it said, he said he knew his time to depart had come. And he began to share with his disciples that which was heavy on his heart. Okay? When, when you're in a situation where you know you've got to say, you know, it's kind of like somebody said, gets you and pulls you aside and says, if you had one thing in life you wanted to do before you die, what would it be? Or if you had one thing to say to somebody, it would be the last time you ever got to talk to them, what would you say? And this is kind of a scenario. This is the last time Jesus is going to be with them in this setting or this type of situation. And the thing that he, you know, he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. And then he goes into the, you know, chapter 14 and 15, 
um, and then through 16, uh, sharing some things from his heart. And then chapter 17 is a great intercessory prayer of the Lord for the, for the uh, disciples in the church. <clears throat> okay? And so last week we kind of finished up in chapter uh, 14. Um, but that the world may know that I love the Father as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Hallelujah. Arise, let us go forth. Now, we didn't really kind of hit this real hard, but as we, we're going to finish and move right into the next one. Jesus said that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Interesting statement there. The way that the world would know that he loved the Father is he did what the Father asked him to do. He obeyed God. Now, I know the narratives right there that, you know, because I'm under grace, I don't have to give, I don't have to have, I don't have to obey. But Jesus said the proof that I love the Father is I, I, I follow his commandment. I do his commandment. Amen? Jesus even says, if ye love me, keep my commandments. Hello? Now, we talked about this. And, um, you know, the 119th Psalm uses different words for the Word of God, the commandments, the statutes, the doctrine of the Lord. Uh, it's, that, that's found in every verse in that psalm except about two or three verses. There's, there's two or three verses that don't have a reference to the commandment, that, you know, it's directly, maybe, maybe indirectly in reference to another verse, but there's like two or three verses maybe throughout the 119th Psalm that don't. And I know that because I recently just read the whole thing and just kind of went back over it. You know, I thought, ah, oh, yeah, a, there is a verse there. Because I had said for a long time, every verse says, well, there's not. There's, there's two or three that don't. Okay? Other than that, the other 165, 70, whatever it is, do. Okay? But they call it precepts, statutes, judgments, law, word, commandment. Okay? So I'm referring to the same thing. That, that which the Lord wants us to do. Okay? What God has told us to do. All righty. Jesus said that the world knows I love the Father because I, you know, I do his commandment. Amen? Um, and so uh, he says, as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. So as the Father's told us things to do. And, and I've said this before. We said it last week. If you love God, you want, you want to do that which pleases him. See, we spend so much time in the church now, and this is one of the, I, I think, uh, shallow, sometimes shallow studying will produce shallow doctrine. I, I need Brother Bill to amen. He, his amen res, it resonates better than anybody's that I know of. Amen. There you go, Brother Bill. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. So the, you know, that, that bassy, you know, baritone resonating voice there. All right. Brother Bill is an Amy corner all by himself. Okay? Hallelujah. Um, but when we, when we start studying things and we don't take the whole, and when we approach it from a self-serving position, then we create self-serving doctrine. Now, we spend so much time trying to prove to people that God's not angry, that God's not going to do anything to them, that God's not. And Jesus preached about hell, people. And the consequences for, for not being in the kingdom of God was hell. Duh. Now, well, that's not love. Yeah, love is he came to save you from hell. He came to redeem you from destruction. Amen. You're, you're destined for something. He came to redeem you from it. To ignore what you're headed for under the guise that God loves you is foolish. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's love. I don't think, it, it's, it's, I don't think that supports the, the doctrine of love in the Bible. Yeah. And, and the fact that, that Jesus taught on hell, that those who rejected and rebelled against him were going to hell, those that dishonored the Father like that, who would not accept God, were going to hell. He came so they didn't have to. There's the love part. The love was even while you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Amen? For God so loved the world in their lost state, he gave his only begotten Son that what? Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It wasn't automatic. Okay? So... Uh, Jesus demonstrated his love for the Father by obeying him. Amen. 
And then he goes on, right after he makes that statement, he moves into chapter 15. Now, you understand the Bible was not written in chapter and verse. Okay? Uh, it, it was written uh, in paragraph form. Many times, it, it, some Bibles, you even get the little paragraph symbol, and it might be it, you know, halfway down another chapter, and that kind of stuff. One, one of the most glaring events is back over in Isaiah 52 and 53. We start in Isaiah 53, 1, and you just think you jumped in the middle of somewhere, but if you back up two or three verses in 52, that's where the whole thought begins to the beginning of chapter 53. I don't know why they put the, the chapter mark where they did. I mean, it just didn't make any sense why they did that. And you need to back up a little, just to three verses, to get the beginning of the context of that whole, that, where that chapter goes. Okay? So this is not a separate thought. Jesus says, Arise, let us go hence. And as they're getting up and leaving, he, he continues talking. Okay? He's still got a lot to say. Are you here? You're going home. I mean, Jesus has a lot to say. He's got to get it out. He said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth much fruit or more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Now, I've, I've had a, a, a soapbox complaint against people who use their title of reverend in political circles or in self-motivations or in motivational circles and going around saying, I can do all things. I can do all things. I can do all things. That's not what it says. Jesus actually said, without me, you can't do anything. And if you'll read the scripture, the whole scripture, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. It's not your ability to do all things in your power. It is the anointed one and his anointing working in you that empowers you to do all things. And let me add this, uh, uh, Ed Taylor, a subthought to that that pertains to life and godliness. Amen? You don't get to do all things that rebel against God through the anointing. Amen. So Jesus begins to tell them, you know, he's been talking to them about love, and, you know, loving one another and, you know, this kind of thing. Now, now look, I'm the vine, you're the branches. You got to abide in me. And without me, you can do nothing. In other words, you've got to get your source of life and strength and inspiration and direction and understanding from me. Amen. And we fail that. See, when we jump over here into the teachings of the church and we, we preach things, we just share things, and do, not, and do not lay the groundwork of what Jesus taught based on the groundwork of what the, what the Old Testament says. These are, not, these are not things cut off one from another. You know, um, uh, you can't go to the Old Testament and make New Testament scriptures fit down into it. We do that a lot of times. People want to do that all the time. We take, you know, take a New Testament scripture and go stuff it into an old one and make it work. Now, the Old Testament conceals the revelation of the new. The New Testament reveals the old. Now, in light of the New Testament, you can go to the Old Testament and get understanding with the light that comes from the New Covenant. Okay, what it was pointing to, what it was referring to. These things the Jews understood. And the perspectives from which they wrote was all these things that they're, that they're, they're building upon and bringing the revelation of the new. Amen? When we come, and let me just you know, kind of be real blunt, with a Western mind. And we jump in there, you know, and I'm under grace, and it doesn't matter what I do, because, you know, you, you've missed something. And we become self-servant, we become self-serving, we become what's in it for me, it's all about me, and we lose the fact that Jesus said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. And if you're not bearing fruit, amen, well, let's, let's kind of jump off here real quick. <laughs> you know what that means with me, don't it? May not make it back this week. 
to where we're jumping off at. Go to Galatians. Look at chapter 5. Let's just pick up in verse 1. I want to get further. You know, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Wow. The true liberty is not the liberty to do whatever you want. And those that are unlearned do rest the scriptures when they start saying so. Now, Peter wrote that about Paul, saying he had many things to say which are hard to be understood, that many which are unlearned do rest. That means twist the scriptures. Okay? Let me, let me go give you a scripture. You don't have to turn. I'm going to run over here real quick to the 119th Psalm. Ah, I need more fingers and more little things in the middle of my Bible. 119, verse 45, And I will walk at liberty... For I seek thy precepts. Freedom. Actually, the Martin says walk in a wide place. You'll walk in liberality and freedom and, and liberty because you seek its precepts. We run, we're running around trying to prove to everybody that we're so free we can do whatever we want to, and we miss the whole point. The freedom you have, Paul even wrote to the church and said, stand fast in liberty wherewith Christ has made you free and don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Your flesh, you know, well, he's, just, he's talking about the law. I, I, dare, I, dare to be, I dare to beg to differ. Because I, Paul, come unto you that if I be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. I testify again to every man that he's circumcised, that he's a debtor to the whole law. Christ is come of no effect unto you. Whosoever are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Now, let's, you think, well, that's not, let's keep reading. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness. Um, by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision avails anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well. Who did um, hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not to him a little of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet be preached circumcision, why do I suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would that they were even cut off. Now, that's pretty blunt in the Greek. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's really blunt in the Greek. I mean, just, you know, let's just forget this. Don't stop the circumcision. Let's go ahead and, and uh, completely remove everything. That's what it says in the Greek, folks. I'm just telling you. Paul was being pretty blunt there. All right? Um, Even we're cut off which bother you. For brethren, you have been called into liberty. Listen to this. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh. He's building this. You see, they're trying to, they're, you know, people are trying to get in the back under the law, that kind of stuff. But see, he's coming really here to tell them, you can't take your liberty and move right back into the occasion for the flesh. You've been liberated from the law, you know, the dictates and commandments of the law that you've got to do this, you've got to do that, and that you're all right because you did this and you did that. He's, you know, no. But he moves, he takes that and lays the foundation for this statement. Don't use your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. Now, I know that's going on in the church today. Jesse sent an article yesterday. I know where she finds this stuff. There's some church out in California that's going to start having a brewery, and you get one or two beers while you're going to church. You can drink it in church. The sermon sounds better after the second one. <laughs> Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can't have, you can't responsibly drink alcohol. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can't responsibly snort cocaine. Oh, they're going to donate some of the proceeds to charity. I thought you were a charity. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can't responsibly shoot up heroin. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can't responsibly smoke some dope. 
I don't have a scripture that tells, you know, as a matter of fact, the funny thing is, the Bible tells us, you know, that wine's a mocker. It doesn't say heroin's a mocker. That went over big. See, we get people who look for the absence of something as permission to do it. But Paul makes it very clear. Don't use your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. Okay? And that's the key. All righty? Uh, where are we here? Brethren, you've been called to liberty. Only use not liberty if for an occasion to the flesh. But by love serve one another. For the law was fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. It's, in other words, the underlying factor of all the law is loving one another. Amen. And we know this is written in light of what Jesus said, that the first commandment is to love the Lord with all your, God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. On this hinge, all the law and the prophets are hang all the law and the prophets, or the, all the, the whole law and prophets are based on those two. Okay? But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consume one another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, there are a lot of things taught in the church today, like the brewery church. People looking for ways to, set, to satisfy their flesh under the guise that they're under grace or whatever, and it's okay. That, in other words, I can cater to my flesh, and it's okay. Because the Bible doesn't say anything about it. But the Bible says if you're walking the Spirit, you're not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. We are not to be giving in to the lust of the flesh. But the Bible's not written so you can go out and just indulge your flesh in anything it wants to indulge in. As a matter of fact, we're supposed to be walking in the Spirit. Hello. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. Listen to this. And these are contrary one to the other. So that ye cannot do the things that ye would. And we could probably sit here and argue back and forth all day long. Give me a scripture that says I can't do such and such. And I might not be able to find a scripture that says you can't do such and such. I can't find one that says don't smoke dope. But you're catering to the lust of the flesh. And because of that, you can't do what you would do. It's contrary. Catering to the flesh is contrary to your spirit, to the will and desire of the Holy Spirit and, and, and what God wants you to do. You can't do what God wants you to do, catering to your flesh. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You should have a desire to obey God and do what God wants you to do. But when you're catering to the flesh, you can't. That means you're going to go to hell because you did it. But you're just, you might end up going to heaven quicker. Not because God's going to judge you, because you, you just live a lifestyle that will bring you, bring you into destruction. But if you be led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. In other words, you know, what did he say here? If you'll walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. You won't have to be under don't, don't uh, lust after your neighbor's wife if you're being led by the Spirit because what? The Spirit won't lead you that way. And you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. To desire your neighbor's wife, to go after your neighbor's wife, to try to have adultery with your neighbor's wife is a lust of the flesh. So if we're led by the Spirit, we're not under the law. I won't have to. And if I'm being led by the Spirit, I don't have to somebody have, have, have a poster on my wall that says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. The Holy Ghost is going to lead me not to commit adultery. Amen. Amen. He's going to work in me to lead me that, away from those things. But we got people trying to convince people that whatever, that whatever whim they have is okay because the grace of God removes that from you and it doesn't matter what you do. That's just wrong. We're not teaching people right. Amen. And he goes on and says this. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Now, of the which I told you before, 
And, and um, I have also told you in time past that they that do such things do not inherit the kingdom of God. Let me stop. And such like. That Greek phrase means, you know, it kind of brings across the thought, this isn't a complete list. This is just, this is just, it's not Strong's exhaustive concordance of sin. Okay? This is just, this is just some of the big ones. But, you know, you know the fact of the matter is, these, he's pointing out this, these are how the flesh acts. It indulges in stuff that are against what God wants. That's what the flesh will do. Read Paul in the 6th, 7th, and 8th chapters of Romans. Man, his, his flesh gave him a hissy fit. But he said God delivers him from it. He's, you see, with his flesh, he obeyed, you know, uh, he, he obeyed the laws of the flesh. But with his heart, he obeyed the laws of God. See, that's why we're to learn to teach people to live by their spirit and live out, of the Holy, live out of their spirit in accordance with the guiding of the Holy Spirit so they won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you be led by the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The Holy Spirit is not going to tell you, go ahead, disobey, fornicate, commit adultery, get drunk, shoot up, do whatever else, even if there's not a scripture that makes a direct reference to it, and it's okay. The Holy Spirit's going to lead you to sanctification and holiness, separation from the things of the world, bring you into the things of the Spirit. Why? Because, he, because God wants you to fulfill the desires of His Spirit, not of your flesh. Remember, remember, the lust of the flesh and the desires of the Spirit are contrary one to the other. Contrary. They work in, for opposite goals. One works, the leading of the Spirit, and the work of the Spirit leads to the honoring of God, the obedience of God, pleasing God. The works of the flesh solely work towards the satisfaction of your carnal desires. And it's against the things of God. If y'all got any more enthusiastic, we might have a, a Pentecostal service here. All right? Trying to bring you out of the first church of the frozen chosen over there, guys. All right. Um, and so he says that. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, you're not fulfilled the lust of the flesh. The flesh lusts against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to, that, to the one to the other, that you cannot do the things you would, but if you be led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditious, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, which I tell you before, to told you in time past, they to do such things, not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith or faithfulness, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Okay? It means to be against such there is no law. That you don't have, see, the, the law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus, which made you free from the law of sin and death. The law of life produces these things in you as you walk with God and you pursue God and you seek after God. They're cultivated and produced in you. You don't need a law. They're cultivated in you as you walk in the Spirit and walk with God and walk in fellowship with Him through His Word. And they that are Christ, now, everyone who has these, these false narratives in the church, they listen to this. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh and the affections and the lust. Wow. Everybody say, wow. Wow. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections there and lust. With the affections and the lust. You keep it under. Paul said, I keep my body under. Paul said, I keep my body under. What's he talking about? He's talking about the lust. He's talking about carnal affections. But if you're Christ, you crucify that. We got, we got whole churches now built on the doctrine, the teaching, and the narrative that you don't have to do anything to your flesh. You're in their grace. It's all good. Let's, get, let's come together and have a brew party at church. It's all good. Let's come and drink. Why don't you start passing out weed when they walk in the door? You know, it probably is already happening. 
We already know that they have rum and stogie men's fellowships. Go sit around and smoke cigars and drink rum for their men's fellowships. What? And I'm, listen, I'm not talking about liturgical, what we would call many times dead churches. I'm talking about word of faith, Holy Ghost used to be churches. What happened to getting together when you had your men's fellowship and praying in tongues and getting the Holy Ghost moving in your fellowship? Instead of, the, instead of having a cloud of cigars, how about that cloud of glory? Yeah. And the presence of God manifest. Yeah. Amen. Well, we get more people to come that way. But you don't change them. They don't put on Christ. Smell like a, smell like a tobacco factory when they leave. And smell like a brewery. If we walk in, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us be desirous of vainglory. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, um, envying one another. Notice, don't be desirous of vainglory. Don't provoke one another. Don't envy one another. Amen? Then Paul goes on and talks about the next chapter. If you see somebody overtaking a fault, restore them. Okay, I get that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to crush people, but I'm trying, you know, in the church, we've got narratives that are harmful. And we're not teaching the whole truth. We're coming in and picking up something after the foundation. And we're building on a foundationless, we're building our houses without a foundation. Then my first house that we built, um, the first house we owned, we rented, and then we, got, we, we came to Greece when we, we bought, we built a house, had a house built. It was, they called it the package. All the walls were, were done in a, in, a, in a factory somewhere. They built, they, 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 and they ship it, and they come in there, and they just, you know, they get the foundation, and then they put it all up. And the thing is, they got the foundation, the foundation had to be done on site, had to be done first. And it wasn't quite modular. It wasn't a modular home. It was still stick built. It was just that the walls were, you know, pre-framed and, and numbered, and they put them up, nailed them together, attached them to the foundation, then put the siding up, did all the work, the electric work. So it, it saved time, and it saved money because all the wood was cut, precision, um, computer cut, and all, and they had just kind of, and came. so you might have an eight-foot section of the wall and another eight-foot section of the wall, and they put them together. The windows were already framed out in it and everything. The windows weren't in it. They were just framed for the windows. So semi-stick built. Okay? Kind of like engineered roof trusses, the engineered walls. They still had to put the siding on. They had to run the insulation. They had to put, uh, they had to do all the other stuff. It just saved them so much time on that, that end of it. Anyway, now on our particular house, we had a slab. You know, they still pour foundation. They put, you know, they go, they dig down, put the footers. Then they come put the slab on top of that. You know, all, electric, all the electric that's in the floor that, you know, that goes at the walls or all the plumbing is all put in there pre. And then, then they start putting that up, building that on there. Now, it's still standing. However, if they'd taken that and got the kit there and just went out there on the ground and leveled the ground out and started sticking that house up, you could have built it. It's clay. It's hard enough to build it on. It would have fallen down in a year or two because it would have settled and cracked and shifted and all this kind of stuff. Well, you've got to have the foundation. When we build doctrine without the foundation, it's going to fall. It's not going to make it. When we build doctrine on a self-serving gospel or a, a message, and people say, you know, um, and we get people come back along and they, they, they get mad with you because you, you say, you know, um, oh, it's just the love of God, 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 the love of God. They all the love of God. God loves you. Yes, he does. And he sent Jesus to redeem you. And then Paul wrote doctrine to the church to take what he taught you and what he gave for you and what he did for you, not to get entangled back again in the yoke of bondage. Don't go back to the flesh. You've been liberated from the power of the flesh. Now the love of God has been shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost, and I want to walk in the Spirit. If I walk in the Spirit, I'm not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's not automatic, but I've got to pursue God. Remember we read from the 119th Psalm, that I will walk in liberty because, or for, or that, in that phrase it means because, I, I seek thy precepts. I'm after the things of God. I'm after the word of God. And I can walk in freedom and liberty when I do that. And the freedom and liberty that I gain 
It's, um, it's okay. I'm not going to take advantage, misuse that, and take it to be used for my own personal gain or my own personal le- le- carnal lust and flesh. Amen? Are you here? All right. And so he writes here, the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, or faithfulness, as we said, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. When you're walking in the Spirit, you're not looking to be able to do things, and it's okay. You're, you're producing love. You're producing joy. Godly, not happiness. Not just being happy. because you, you can be happy because Carolina won the national championship. You can be happy because Duke lost. Amen. I might be happier when Duke loses than I am when Carolina wins. I think I'm more anti-Duke than I am pro-Carolina. Hallelujah. Uh, no, but joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, faithfulness. See, we got faith in there, but really that, that word is faithfulness in the Greek, not just faith. It's not believing. It's being faithful. This, this, see, a fruit of the Spirit is being faithful. Moreover, a, a steward must be found. What did Paul say? A steward must be found Faithful. Amen. Meekness and temper, te- uh, uh, temperance. Uh, oh, that word. T- t- temperance. Self control. Constraining your activities. Constraining your flesh. Telling it no. We spend so much time in church telling people it doesn't matter what you do with your flesh. What we are, we are borderline Gnostics with some of our teaching. Are you here? Gnosticism was a doctrine or a teaching that was going around in the early church. It's come back numerous times since then. We even have a denomination. Christian scientists are just basically nothing but modern-day Gnostics. That the, the, the flesh is not real. This material is not real. It's only, only spiritual matters. We're getting to that in the church. In the, in, in the charismatic, word of faith, Holy Ghost church, a lot of us are now getting to a Gnostic, a Gnostic or semi-Gnostic uh, teaching. It doesn't matter what I do. I'm under grace. So it doesn't matter what I do with my flesh. Yet the word of God says that one of the fruits or one of the, one of the parts of the fruit of the spirit is self-control. You temper and control your flesh. What's this got to do with love? Remember, Jesus is talking about, throughout most of this, he doesn't sit and talk about how much God loves them. He talks about what they would do if they love God. It even uses himself as an example that because whatever Father gave him, he does. And that proves he loves God. Then he comes back and says, you're the, I'm the vine, you're the branches. In, uh, in what, what do branches produce? But where, where, how did, what, uh, but if you're on a grapevine, you're not going to produce tomatoes. You're producing what the vine gives you. The D, that's right, the DNA or the, the, um, the, the, um, I don't know if they use DNA in, in, in plants. What do they use? They do? DNA? Okay. The DNA of a plant. Now, we may be wrong, so if you're a biologist or, or, or a botanist or whatever, and I'm wrong, get, I'm, try, I'm trying to make a point here, that whatever the, the, the makeup of the vine is, is what the branches will draw from and produce. You're not going to get tomatoes on a great, on, out of a, on the branches that are getting it, it's hooked up to the grape vine. This branch is not going to produce tomatoes. They're going to produce grapes. And so Jesus comes back, and he's been, he's been talking about loving God, keeping his commandments. And then he says, and right before he moves into this, and says, I, the fact, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it. The way people know I love my Father is because the commandment he, gave, he gives me, I do it. I'm the van, you're, I'm the vine, you're the branches. It's not a separate thought. This is how you're to act. You're to act like me. You're to do like me. Are you here? 
your branches, I'm the vine, you receive your instruction for the fruit you produce from the vine. Amen. Without me, you can't do anything. You're not an independent state. You are, you're Borg. You're assimilated. Amen? You've been added to the collective. You've lost your distinctiveness. Lower your shields. <laughs> we are Borg. Lower your shields. We will add your biological distinctiveness to our collective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You will be assimilated. Well, Christ says we're supposed to be assimilated with him. We've been grafted, and we're wild brain. We were grafted in, and we produce out of him. I, you know, let's, go back, let's go back to John now, chapter 15. We've got to get around to closing here. Fixing. What's that mean? Commencing, to begin, to start, to think about. Verse 4, abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot produce fruit except of itself, of, its, of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you, except you abide in me. Now, wait a second now. See, we can't run over here to the New Testament uh, letters, epistles, and take something Paul might say or Peter might say or James might say and completely forget about what Jesus said. It doesn't work that way. Well, that was an Old Testament book, technically. It's still the foundation upon which, when Paul talked about, as it was written in the Scripture, we know what he was talking about? The old stuff. There wasn't any new stuff to call Scripture at that point in time. He, when he referred to Scripture, he referred to the old. As it is written. Hello? And so Jesus says... I'm the vine. So when Jesus says this, think about this. When we come to the New Testament, we're talking about, you know, don't cater to the flesh, don't do this. Jesus is saying, give it to the Spirit. Draw, produce that which you're connected to. And what you're connected to does not give, give uh, credence, does not give occasion, does not um, give authority to the lust of the flesh. Amen? We are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit, and have no confidence in the flesh. Kind of, kind of more like almost a line of making no provision for the flesh. Are y'all here you go home? See, Jesus is he's making this point. Um, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit um, fruit I mean, bring forth much fruit for without me you can do nothing if a man abide not in me he is cast forth as a branch and withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned if you abide in me and my words abide in you you shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you herein is my father glorified that you bear much fruit so shall ye be my disciples now stop we always jump in here and take um, the part, you'll ask what you will, it shall be done unto you, without the other part. I ain't have what I say, baby. I can just go out here and say it, and I get it. But Jesus said, if you abide in me, my words abide in you. Not just you're born again, but his teaching, his doctrine, his, his commandments, his precepts are abiding in you. Why? Because they'll direct you in ways that are not leading you to the lust of the flesh. And remember, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit, when he's coming, is going to bring all things to your remembrance, whatever he said. He's going to take his teachings and bring them to remembrance. Amen. Are y'all here? You're going home. His word must abide in us. Then you'll ask what you want. Why? Because see, when his words about you, you're not going to ask for things like your neighbor's wife, number one. And I just use that because that's when, you know, when people wouldn't do 
Please don't even tell me that you are so, that you are so naive. You believe there are people out there who aren't so carnally driven by their flesh. They think they can believe they were sick. Listen, I know, of, I know of a situation where the pastor was having them uh, committing adultery with the worship leader, organist, piano, keyboard, whatever she was. Music. And he left her, his wife, she left her husband, and there was another church somewhere else before they even got divorced from their spouses. Had already set up a plan for them to move up there. They were going to marry them and restore them back to ministry before they were ever divorced. Instead of rebuking them for, the, for living in sin. We have a famous Christian musician that, you know, uh, gets and tells their testimony about how they met their husband. They met their husband making a music video while they were married. And they, talk, they make us out like this love story. Listen, now I'm, I'm all for forgiveness. There's restoration. There's forgiveness. But please don't get out here and make it look like what your stuff is a love story. It's a lust story. It had nothing to do with love. It had to do with lust. Don't, don't let it. You, know, you, you mean you could have got up and said, look, what we did was wrong. It's over with. We've asked God to forgive us. We've asked the people that we hurt to forgive us. And God's, God's letting us move forward. But we were wrong in what we did. We don't, we don't encourage anybody to follow the example we set. As a matter of fact, the example we set is not godly. God has forgiven us. We thank God for that. That's what should have been said instead of glorifying this love story. Hello. The carnal lust story. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Verse 9, as the Father hath loved me, even so I loved you. Continue in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Wow. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. We major so much on that God loves us, we forget that because he loves us and we've come into his kingdom, we're to love him and to please him and to honor him and to do as he says. We leave that out. Why? It doesn't sell a lot of books and doesn't put enough back ends of the seats. Because we don't want anybody to feel like they feel bad. I'm not trying to make people feel bad, but these are, they, listen, I mean, if you're, if you're giving into your flesh, you're walking contrary to what God wants. And you can't walk in the Spirit like He wants you to walk in the Spirit. You can't be what He wants you to be. And you're missing out what He's done for you. These things have I spoken unto you that your joy might, that my joy might, might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. And i got to stop right here. we got to stop. I, I will just pick up next week right here, all right? Somebody write it down. I'm stopping in verse 12. Who wrote that down? Who wrote it down? All right. Thank you, Linda. Amen. Do you, see, when, when, you, when you create a narrative, listen, this is with any doctrine in the Bible. When you create a narrative and you forego anything else in the Bible, you get skewed. Are you here? When you do not allow the Word of God to show you the whole, you will get a skewed prospectus. Amen. Y'all hear you gone home. God wants us to walk in the fullness of the counsel, walk in all the counsel of God. Amen? Yes, God loves us with a love that's, from, that's beyond uh, understanding almost. It's so great that he gave his only begotten son that even while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive together and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Still got to act on it. But because of that, he says, now, if you love the God, if you love God, and that, we already know God loves us. And God's already done and proven his love and demonstrated his love. Now, if you love him, you're going to do what he wants. 
the way he wants it, in accordance with his word, if you love him. We spend so much time trying to manipulate people into being saved. I, I, story. <laughs> Jamie and I first came to Greensboro. We, we came to the church. The church was our pre-existing. Pastor had passed away. Um, never met him. You know, but we, 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 knew pe- we know people who knew him well, and um, they loved him. It was a good, you know, his heart was good. He died of cancer. And you can sit around and try to figure out why, what happened. What, that, that, what, that's, he, he, he's gone. Brother Bill, do you know him? Yeah, okay. Brother Bill knew the, knew the pastor. Um, he, he was, you know, he loved God. Okay? And um, where was I going? I had a... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was a guy in the church. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I came to know him as probably one of the greatest manipulators I've ever met in my life. I mean, just absolutely a manipulator. Demonic. And um, came to church one Sunday morning, and there's this girl up on the front row, and she, she came, went through service, and had to serve. She's over there calling, crying and bawling and stuff. And I kind of walk over and find out what's going on. This guy's talking to her. Well, fine. She was a co-employee where he worked. And he had gotten her saved at work. And she said, and I, and I hear her saying, I don't want to be saved. But you, you prayed. I know you prayed. You're born again. And I stepped in. I said, did you mean that when you prayed? He got mad with me over this. I don't care. You're trying to convince this person they're saved and they're not. She said, no. I said, you didn't want to be, I, I, I didn't want to. He, he just, he put so much pressure on her. She finally acquiesced and just prayed, said the words. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Now he's doing it, why? Because this is, his, this is a notch on his belt. He, he's, a super, he's a super soul winner. Hello? I know you prayed the prayer. I know you're saved. She's bawling because she don't want to be saved. She's a heathen. And I, and I stopped and said, listen. I, I, I was honest with her. I said, look, okay. It's obvious you're not born again. Anytime you want to, and God deals with your heart, and you want, come back, we'll pray with you. And she never did, but I mean, you know, she could have gotten somewhere else. But I wasn't going to send her out that door convinced she was a Christian, and she wasn't. But see, we get so caught up with trying to force people into something, trying to make it so good, make it, make it so easy to get saved. Well, it is if we do it right. But you don't have, you know, you know keep living like you're living. You know, and, and I get, you know, there's a way of saying that without saying that, but that's what people say. It doesn't matter what you do. God loves you. God loves you. Yes, he does. He loves you just like you are. Yes, he does. Now. He lo- let, me, let me say it this way. He loves you in the state you're in, but he doesn't want you to stay that way. So when we say he loves you just like you are, there, there's, there's more really behind that than, you know, God loves you as a sinner. Yes, he does. But he loves you so much that he sent Jesus to deliver you from that and reconcile you to himself. He doesn't love you so much, he's going to leave you in that. The love of God came to deliver you from that and bring you out of that lifestyle, to bring you out of the bondage of captivity of being under Satan's dominion and authority, to bring you out of those things. That's what the love of God, not to say, I love you just like you are. You just stay there. I continue to love you. No, the love said you have to be delivered from that. And because you can't deliver you, and the only way to deliver you is my son come and pay you price for you. What you've done, I've sent my son so that you can be delivered. You still have to believe on him, but he's going to take the penalty. He's going to take the shame. He's going to take the authority away from Satan that allows you to believe my son and be delivered from that. That's how much I love you. But then Jesus comes back and says, now, if you love the Father, or if you love me, Keep my commandments. Paul writes and says, 
you know, that the, the, the lusts of the flesh are contrary to the leading of the Spirit. There's love things a two-way street. I can tell you, you can have, you can have a, a man loves a woman, a woman not like the man. It won't work. No matter how much he loves her, no matter how much she doesn't love him back, it's not going to work. Are you here? Yeah, but he loves her no matter what she does. It still won't work. I don't care what you say. It won't work if she doesn't love him. Somebody say, help me, Jesus. All righty. Praise God. Amen. So we'll pick up at verse 13 next week in John chapter 15. Until then, remember this, that this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. We love you. God bless you. See you next time. And, be, and walk in the love of God and be and act on the love of God towards other people. Love your neighbor as yourself. In Jesus' name, see you next time. Hallelujah. Amen.